Hello, my name is Roger Lewis. I'm a senior medical scientist at Berry Consultants. Today I'm going to talk about data and safety monitoring boards, specifically from the point of view of overseeing adaptive clinical trials. So what is a data and safety monitoring board? It's a panel or group charged with the independent oversight of an ongoing clinical trial. This is generally required for a phase three trial or equivalent trial, and it's increasingly used to provide oversight of earlier phase two or learn phase trials as well. The members of a data and safety monitoring board traditionally include scientific and clinical domain experts, statisticians, and in many cases also ethicists or patient representatives, all of whom work together to help provide oversight of the ongoing trial. The purposes of a data and safety monitoring board are primarily to protect subjects from avoidable risk. We're working in a research environment, so there is always some risk which is unavoidable because we don't truly know the effect of the treatments or the safety profiles of the treatments we're investigating. The Data Safety Monitoring Board is also there to ensure trial integrity and to ensure that there is an appropriate ethical balance between the risks and the benefits to the patients and society. As a secondary goal, the DSMB also operationalizes the sponsor's goals and values regarding the situations in which there should be continued testing and evaluation of the product versus termination of product evaluation, for example, if the treatment effect is not as large as one had hoped. In the context of overseeing an adaptive clinical trial, we need to understand what is different about an adaptive clinical trial from a traditional trial. Here, we're going to use the term adaptation to mean making planned, well-defined changes in key clinical trial design parameters during trial execution based on data accruing within the trial itself to achieve goals of validity, scientific efficiency, and safety. By planned, we mean that the adaptations are defined a priori. By well-defined, we mean that the criteria for making those adaptations are known ahead of time. And by key parameters, we mean that we are changing important things about the trial, such as the number of treatment arms, the doses of medications that are used, or the number of patients that are rolled between interim analyses. We want to do this in a way that achieves scientific and statistical validity. So a key role of a data and safety monitoring board is to make sure that the trial is conducted in a way so those adaptations are implemented as they were originally intended, unless there is a good scientific or ethical reason not to do so. This is a cartoon from JAMA published in 2006 that simply shows that in an adaptive trial, it is the data that determines the path that is taken from the beginning of the trial, shown as the oval at the top, to whatever the end of the trial is, which is, of course, determined by the patterns of treatment efficacy and safety observed within the trial. This a diagram shows the internal process of an adaptive trial. It starts with some initial data collection rules and initial allocation rules. Uh, those determine the randomization proportions between the treatment arms and the number of patients who are enrolled before we take a first interim look at the data. At the first interim look, we analyze those available data, which will often be incomplete, and ask ourselves whether we have met one of the pre-specified stopping rules for the trial. Assuming we haven't, we use those initial data to revise the allocation and sampling rules using the pre-specified adaptive algorithm defined by the trial and continue the data collection. This continues in a circular motion until we meet one of the pre-specified stopping rules, one of which is always that we have met the maximum allowed sample size for the trial. At that point, we may stop the trial, or if this is an adaptive process embedded with a state within a stage or phase of the trial, we may then move to another stage or phase of the trial. The Data and Safety Monitoring Board needs to understand how the trial was intended to operate so they can verify that each one of these pieces is being implemented as it was designed. In order to understand the operating characteristics of a trial of this complexity, one uses trial simulation in which thousands of virtual trials are simulated under an assumed reality with respect to the patient population, the rate of accrual, the efficacy of the treatments, and the safety profile in order to determine the trial's fundamental operating characteristics, power, risk of a type 1 error, etc. 
This is information that will be presented to the Data and Safety Monitoring Board before the trial is ever initiated so that the DSMB has time to ask about how the trial is to be conducted, what its performance characteristics should be, and even investigate the behavior of single virtual trials so they start to understand what the partial information in the trial might look like once it is actually implemented. When one reflects on the recent history in clinical trials, we realize that a substantial fraction of all confirmatory trials fail, even though they were designed based on promising early results. Investigators can often anticipate what the design decisions they wish, wish they could take over or change if a trial were known to have failed. And these are areas that we call anticipated regret that are the targets for adaptation. So for example, if you're testing a drug at a given dose, and you knew that it failed to demonstrate efficacy, one might immediately wish that we had tested a higher dose. And a good adaptive design would take that into account and automatically allow a dose escalation should the safety profile of the lower dose um, be adequate. The reason the oversight from the Data and Safety Monitoring Board is important is because stuff can happen during the conduct of a trial that wasn't anticipated and therefore was not taken into account during the design and simulation of the adaptive trial. Now, there should be some caution about the introduction of a human decision-making with all of its uncertainties into a carefully designed clinical trial. The Data and Safety Monitoring Board, because of requirements of integrity and independence from the sponsor, works in isolation. And therefore, if they make poor decisions, they can really screw up a well-designed trial. And if the trial is innovative in its design, the DSMB must understand what the trial is supposed to do so they know if something is going wrong, for example, a blunder in implementing the trial algorithm, so they can understand what the trial was designed to do so that they know whether it is no longer appropriate to do what the trial was designed to do. And they need to recognize the impact on trial validity if they make unprespecified changes to the trial design. So what is different about a DSMB overseeing an adaptive trial versus a DSMB overseeing a traditional trial? The difference is that the DSMB must have the expertise to assess whether the planned adaptations continue to be safe and appropriate, and they must have the ability to verify that the planned adaptations are being implemented properly. But perhaps what's more important is what is unchanged for an adaptive trial. The DSMB continues to have as a primary role the goal of ensuring the completion of the trial as planned, but in this case, that includes the adaptations. In other words, it is the trial that is adaptive. It is not the DSMB. I want us to take a moment to talk about a challenge in identifying members for DSMB that has to do with the correlation between expertise and apparent conflict of interest. The number of statisticians and clinicians with extensive experience in adaptive design is quite limited. And therefore, when trying to find people with high degrees of expertise in the clinical, scientific, or statistical domain, one in general identifies people who also have a greater degree of perceived conflict of interest. The DSMB should be constituted to balance that and to have some members with great expertise but some perception, potential perception of a conflict of interest with also members who are relatively free of conflict of interest. A question that often gets asked to me is whether working on the design of an adaptive trial automatically creates a conflict of interest so that the person who worked on the design cannot work on the DSMB. And whereas there are many possible uh, perceptions of that level of conflict of interest, and a different answer may apply appropriately in different circumstances, I think it's important to make a distinction between an interest in the success of the product and an interest in the successful conduct of the trial. In general, an independent design consultant who's worked on the design of the trial does have a vested interest in ensuring the trial is conducted as it was intended, but in many cases, that does not extend to a need or a belief or a desire for the product to be ultimately shown to be effective. In fact, I consider an adaptive trial that rapidly identifies an ineffective treatment and terminates to have been a highly successful trial. So a key goal of a good adaptive design is that it fails efficiently, but hopefully in many cases also efficiently demonstrates the true benefit of the treatments we're investigating. 
In selecting a chair for the Data Safety Monitoring Board, it's important to realize the chair must have a working understanding of all of the clinical, statistical, logistical, and regulatory considerations affecting the trial, and be able to facilitate the deliberations in such a way that it incorporates all the relevant expertise and perspectives from the committee. They need to be aware of the regulatory considerations if non-pre-specified changes are made in the design, and they must have the av available time so that they can flex substantial time and effort to devote to DSMB activities should something happen the in the trial that is unanticipated. As an aside, I'd like to make a comment about the placing of key scientific opinion leaders on DSMBs. Sometimes sponsors would like to choose key opinion leaders, clinical key opinion leaders, on DSMBs in anticipation of a successful trial and with the hope that the experience that key opinion leader acquires within uh, the service on the DSMB will help make them a positive spokesperson for the product itself. In my experience, such choices can be highly problematic for DSMB membership because those key opinion leaders often have limited time for preparation and DSMB work. They often have preformed opinions regarding the product, which may be positive or negative. And the authority that, and the influence they have on the DSMB may exceed their understanding of some of the statistical challenges associated with the interpretation of sparse data. In addition, many key opinion leaders who are wonderful clinicians lack a deep familiarity with considerations of trial integrity, the, the preservation of designed operating characteristics, and similar regulatory issues. Unfortunately, there is no standardized training for DSMB members in general, let alone for an adaptive trial. So one must devote greater time to allow people to come to understand the adaptive design prior to the initiation trial and prior to putting them in the position where they're overseeing that trial. The DSMB should learn about the design from the team that designed it, and ideally this learning occurs before the first patient is enrolled. The DSMB should have an early face-to-face -face meeting where they review the final protocol and the DSMB charter. They should have a detailed explanation of the adaptive design, its rationale, and the simulation results. And it is important to present example single simulated trials with the adaptations that occur within those trials so the DSMB members start to gain a familiarity with how the trial might play out. This also allows the DSMB members to ask important questions that they could never ask once they have seen unblinded data. The efficacy and safety considerations that might be important to patients but are not captured with the adaptive design should also be discussed at some length. They should also consider whether there are potential sources of drift in the treatment effect for the patient population, for example, a learning curve in using a new device or surgical intervention, or perhaps changes in the patient population that occur because sites in different geographic areas are coming online at different times. So in conclusion, the membership of a DSMB overseeing an adaptive trial should include a variety of clinical, adaptive design, and clinical research expertise. Conflict of interest should be minimized so the DSMB can work independently, but we should do so in such a way that doesn't sacrifice the necessary expertise. Pre-trial education of the DSMB is critical, and a detailed pre-trial meeting uh, will help the DSMB understand the design in detail protect the trial validity, and protect the sponsor's interests. Thank you very much.